Um, I'm going to start with uh, a brief background about cystic fibrosis. So, um, Kim, if we can just move this. Thank you. So cystic fibrosis, as John has mentioned, is a recessive genetic disorder. It affects approximately 100,000 people worldwide, and there are about 5,000 Canadians currently living with this disease. It is a multi-organ disease um, affecting various parts of the body, um, but the most morbidity and mortality is due to progressive lung disease. In fact, progressive end-stage lung disease is the primary cause of premature death in patients with cystic fibrosis. In order to stay healthy, patients with CF have to conduct really time-consuming, expensive, and complicated therapies. And you see on the screen here some of the therapies that people have to do. And this is not just a therapy for a few days, a few weeks, even a month. This is lifelong therapy that they have to do from the time that they're diagnosed until the time that they die. And so it's very complicated and trying to improve the quality of life and the therapies that patients have access to is extremely important. There are several Canadian success stories related to CF. And one of the biggest ones John alluded to earlier was the discovery of the CF gene by researchers at the Hospital for Sick Children, which happened in 1989. The CF gene, located on the long arm of chromosome 7, is instructions to code for a protein that sits in the cell membrane and acts as a chloride channel. This is called the CFTR protein. It moves chloride across the cell membrane in order to keep the um, mucus in the body lubricated. Basically, um, the pathophysiology in CF what happens is the, the gene is defective, it's the incorrect instructions, it makes a protein that doesn't work properly, and that sets up a situation of thick mucus that becomes sticky and sticks in the airways, causing infection and inflammation in the lungs, which further damages the lungs. So this vicious, vicious cycle is a downstream effect of CF. These new therapies that we were talking about actually have the potential to correct the um, uh, protein function and actually prevent some of the downstream complications of CF. But how do these drugs work? So there are two types. One are correctors and one are potentiators. The correctors are designed to get the CFTR protein to the cell surface, to the right location. And on the left-hand side, you see a cell in CF and the protein is made, but it's not uh, made properly. So the body recognizes that and actually breaks down the protein before it gets to the cell surface. Only a small proportion of protein actually reaches the cell surface. With some of these corrector drugs, this actually forces the protein to get to the right spot in the cell membrane. And so there are more channels that are um, present at the right location. Unfortunately, the protein still has a problem, a second problem, which is that it, it acts as a chloride channel, but the chloride channel is closed. So even if it's in the right location, it's not functioning properly. That's where the second potentiator drugs come in. They bind to the protein when it's in the cell membrane and actually open the channel so that it can transport chloride across the cell membrane, lubricate the secretions, and stop that thick, sticky mucus and vicious cycle of infection and inflammation. Um, as John mentioned, uh, a newer modulator therapy is a, uh, called Trikafta is a combination of two corrector drugs and a potentiator drug, which act to correct the CFTR protein. This drug is the biggest advancement in the treatment in CF in the history of this disease. And now I'm going to turn over to my colleague, Dr. Sonia Stanojevic, who will share some what I think are quite compelling results from our, our study. Thank you very much, Anne, and thank you everyone for joining us today. As Anne mentioned, my talk will focus on the results of our study that will be published on Monday. And what's different about this study compared to the evidence that we have to date is that our study looks at the potential impact on the entire CF population. There's no doubt that the phase three clinical trials and anecdotal evidence from individual patients highlights the, the remarkable effects of this treatment. And in these study results, we show you what could happen to the entire CF population by the year 2030. 
As John mentioned, in Canada, we're incredibly fortunate that we have one of the most comprehensive and longest standing patient registries in the world. Since the 1970s, we have collected vital statistics, demographics, and detailed clinical information on virtually all of the patients living with cystic fibrosis. This allows us to understand the health and well being of the CF population, and we produce annual reports to summarize this. But it's also really important for evaluating whether the treatments and interventions that we have are working. And more recently, we've been using it to forecast what the healthcare needs of the population will be like in the future. One of the things that we look at in the CF population, and particularly with the registry data, is reporting on the estimated median age of survival. This is one of our standard um, outcomes that we look at, and I'm going to highlight a couple things on this figure. So what you have on your X on your Y axis is the median age at survival. So this is the age at which we expect 50% of the population born today to live to. And then you have the calendar years on the bottom. So what's quite remarkable about CF is that in the 1980s, the median age at survival was about 25 years. And in our latest registry report in 2018, the median age at survival was estimated to be 52 years. These remarkable changes, as Anne has mentioned, are related to the fact that we've been treating the symptoms of the disease. We've been dealing with the, um, the downstream effects and Trikafta has the possibility to improve the underlying defect. And what we want to know is what will happen to these median age at survival statistics in the overall population if Trikafta was available in 2021. So many of you may be familiar with uh, the technique that we've used. It's called micro simulation analysis. It's a dynamic forecasting model that's widely used in public health policy research. And what we've done is taken the CF population, um, and this is quite unique to our study, is that we've taken everybody that's alive with CF in 2018, and we've taken exactly where their health status is in 2018 as well. So we know for those individual um, nearly 5,000 patients exactly where they were in 2018. And then we've modeled out year by year what would happen to them under different scenarios. We look at what the trajectory would be like if nothing changes, um, and importantly, what would happen with Trikafta. We selected 2030 as our endpoint to look at the effects of this therapy, um, but certainly we can look at shorter term effects and longer term effects, and also we can update these models as new information becomes available. So I'll just go into a little bit de of detail about the three scenarios in particular that, that we've looked at with this study. Um, the first, as I mentioned, is our baseline scenario or what would happen if nothing changes. Um, now we will still anticipate improvements in the population. We still are gonna be treating people with CF. We'll still see their improvements, um, but it's if no other therapies come along. And then we have what would happen if Trikafta was initiated in 2021, um, an early scenario. Um, and what would happen if there was up to a five year delay in the availability of Trikafta? So if it wasn't available until 2025. Now, obviously, with any projection, we have to make some assumptions. As I mentioned, one of the strengths of our study is that we didn't have to make any assumptions about the underlying population or who would be benefiting from this therapy. And what we've done is we've selected the patients in the study that have the Delta F508 mutation. So this is the mutation that would make them eligible for Trikafta therapy. And we've allowed those 90% of the population to receive the therapy. We've anticipated a 14% improvement in lung function. This is the average effect that was observed in the phase three clinical trial. And we've allowed individuals to have a range of improvements based on the range of improvements that were observed in that phase three trial. We also assume that Trikafta will have a sustained effect. We know from the earlier versions or the earlier types of drug, Ivacaftor, that patients have a 50% reduction in the rate of lung function decline. And so we've assumed that with Trikafta, the population will have that same sustained effect and that there'll be a reduction in how quickly the disease progresses. Based on those phase three study results, we've also assumed that individual patients will have a 63% reduction in hospitalizations or chest infections. And these are the most severe manifestations of disease where patients are typically hospitalized anywhere from two weeks to three months or even longer um, with chest infections. And let's dive in right into the results. So what we have here is our projected patient status. 
So as I mentioned, dynamic simulation takes the population and year to year we transition what might happen to them under the different scenarios. The A bars are the, uh, represent the baseline, that's if nothing changes. And as you can see, we'll still see increases in the total population. We'll still see improvements in people living with mild disease. But I want you to focus on the B graphs. This is what would happen if Trikafta was available in 2021. And let's first look at those people living with severe disease. We will see a 60% reduction in the proportion of patients living with severe disease. This is remarkable, especially because this is the subset of the population that has the greatest healthcare need and utilization. They have the poorest quality of life. And if we can reduce 60% of severe disease, this will have a huge impact, not only on those individual patients, but on the healthcare system and the resources required to care for patients with cystic fibrosis. On the other hand, we also see an improvement in the number of people that are gonna be living with mild disease. These are the green graphs on the bar, and you see that over time, especially immediately after Trikafta is improved, we see small cumulative improvements such that by 2030, there'll be an increase of 18% of those people living with mild disease. This is quite substantial because it's the people that live with mild disease that have the least healthcare utilization needs, but they also lead quite productive and uh, high quality of life. And so by increasing the number that are living in this productive stage, um, we can have not only impacts on the healthcare system, but on society overall. Now, as can be expected, if we're gonna re be reducing the number of people living with severe disease, we're also gonna see fewer lung transplants. Lung transplants are an end of life um, therapy that's available to people in the very sickest, most severe form of disease. And there are considerable costs, again, both to the healthcare system and individual patients to receive lung transplant and then also live with um, post lung transplant afterwards. We also looked at the median age of survival statistics. So if you recall, um, in 2018, our median age of survival was 52 years. And if we project out our baseline scenario, so no new therapies, no new interventions, by 2030, we anticipate that this will increase to about 58 years. <clears throat> now, you saw tremendous improvements from the 1980s to 2018, but in the most recent years, we are seeing a bit of leveling off, and these models are taking that into account. Now, let's focus on the Trikafta being available in 2021 scenario. If we have this therapy available um, in 2021, what we will see is an increase in the median age of survival of nine years. What that means that a baby born in 2030 will be expected to live nine years longer or the median age of survival will be nine years longer than in the current baseline scenario where there are no new therapies. And this is quite a remarkable improvement in such a short period of time. At the individual level, the patients that are alive and living with CF right now will also see a 15% reduction in the number of deaths in this 11 year period, which again is a pretty significant number of people whose lives will be extended because of this therapy. And the last thing we'll look at is the reduction of hospitalizations. I mentioned that our models assumed a reduction in individual hospitalizations. And obviously, cumulatively over time, that all result in a reduction in hospitalizations overall. So the black bars on this graph, these are the number of pulmonary exacerbations, the number of hospitalizations that we expect to observe in the scenario where there are no new therapies. And the red lines are the scenario where Trikafta is available in 2021. We'll observe an immediate reduction in the number of hospitalizations, and this cumulative effect will result in 4,400 4, 4, fewer hospitalizations over that 11-year period. Now, the, the gray graphs, you start to get a glimpse of what might happen in the delayed scenario. We'll still see improvements and a reduction in the number of hospitalizations, but the reduction is going to be significantly muted. And we'll look at the uh, delayed scenario in a little bit more detail. So what's going to happen if we delay the scenario? Here's our survival analysis again. The bottom line is our baseline scenario. What would happen if nothing changes? Recall this is about 58 years. We have Trikafta available in 2021 at the very top. This is our best case scenario with a 67 year uh, median age at survival. And certainly if Trikafta is available in 2025, we'll still see improvements. But in this scenario, we'll only see a 3.3 year improvement in the survival by 2023. And so 
Absolutely, Trikafta is still going to have a benefit whenever it's introduced into the Canadian population, but these results really highlight this cumulative effect. Because we're fixing the underlying cause of CF, we're able to reduce those downstream effects, and the sooner we can implement this therapy, the sooner we can improve the health status of people and maintain their health status, the more benefit there will be overall, both to the individual survival metrics, but also to the population and the healthcare resources that are going to be required overall. As I mentioned, many of you may already be familiar with microsimulation, but I just wanted to highlight some of the strengths and limitations of this approach. So Health Canada and um, public health policymakers in Canada are not, um, this isn't new to them, this is a widely used technique. Um, that's used in chronic uh, health disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's. Um, it's more, more recently been used in um, the COVID-19 projections. And it's a really powerful tool for public health policy that we can use to predict what might happen to the population. Certainly these populations are or these projections are based on a series of assumptions and we have to be quite confident in the assumptions that we're making. Um, but they do provide us with a glimpse as to what the population may look like in the future. I also want to highlight that some of our assumptions and projections are quite conservative. Our assumptions assume that the drug will only be available for those 12 years and older because that's the, the current um, status of the drug. But we know that there are multiple phase three clinical trials in those that are six to 11 years old and even moving down to those that are two to five years of age. And if this therapy in that 11 year period is available to even younger people, we can anticipate that the effects on the healthcare system and the population overall will be much more profound than what we're projecting today. And I'd be remiss not to talk about the uncertainty of our estimates. As I mentioned, all of our projections are based on the assumptions. We have looked at shorter term projections. So without the Trikafta scenario, we went back in time to see how these models perform in our CF population where we know what the outcomes are. And we're fairly certain that these short term projections are quite robust. And certainly validating these projections in the long term is going to be challenging. We can anticipate what other potential therapies might come along or what other complications or infections like COVID-19 and how they may affect our population moving forward. But I will say that these projections can be extremely powerful for understanding what the population may be and understanding the potential impact. And I hope that today we've highlighted that on a population level, this therapy could be quite profound for the CF population. And I'm going to hand off to Dr. Stevenson again to highlight some of the individual scenarios that we've observed um, in, in the Canadian population. Thanks, Sonia. I just want to end with a couple of um, stories from two of my patients. And, and this really is an effort to bring to life the impact of this drug. So you can see firsthand what it has done or what it means to this patient population. The first uh, patient is Ashley, who is a 27 year old woman. Um, she has severe lung disease with lung function that is 28% of normal. Um, she has, her lung disease has progressed over the last year and a half to the point where she needs oxygen to keep her oxygen levels normal in her bloodstream, both at rest and with exertion. Despite eating a high fat diet and trying to maximize her calories every single day, she still is malnourished. Her weight is below 100 pounds and her BMI is only 17. She has diabetes and has to check her blood sugars routinely multiple times a day, giving herself injections. And she's had multiple courses of IV antibiotics in the last year for recurrent chest infections um, in her lungs. Because of the deterioration in her health, she's been unable to work for the past year and really has just been focusing on trying to stay well. In March 2020, she was at the point where we had to discuss lung transplant. So we actually referred and assessed her for a lung transplant. And she was about to be listed for a lung transplant when we applied for uh, compassionate access to Trikafta. She was granted access and started Trikafta on April 24th, 2020 through this program. Within one month of therapy, she started to feel amazing. In fact, it happened even within a few days of therapy. She no longer has a cough, no longer produces mucus. This is something she's done for 27 years of her life. Her lung function has gone from 28% of normal to 51% of normal. 
She's gained over five kilos, so that's 11 pounds in weight, and her BMI is approaching the normal range at 19.3. Most remarkably though, she actually, her lung function has improved so much that she actually doesn't need oxygen anymore. She's taking less insulin to manage her diabetes. And the best part is her quality of life has improved to the point where she can enjoy fun things and she's actually back to work full time. And I asked Ashley, I said, what, what does it mean for you to have access to Trikafta? And the quote at the bottom of the slide sort of sums it up. She says, my dreams have come true. I am officially living a normal life where I can plan a future with no fears. Now, um, the next patient is Michaela, and I want to highlight her situation because she hasn't been as lucky as Ashley to be able to access Trikafta. She's a 24-year-old student at Western University, and her baseline lung function is 55% of normal. Unfortunately, she has recurrent infections, and when she's sick, her lung function drops substantially into the 30% range, and she's really quite unwell with fever, increased respiratory symptoms, and she feels terrible. In the last 18 months, she's been hospitalized or on home IV antibiotics multiple times, and in fact, in preparation for this presentation, I went back and actually counted up the number of days she's received antibiotics, and it's 265 days in the last 18 months. So think about that, almost a year of therapy, if it was continuous, a continuous year of therapy, and she still um, is not, is not uh, stable. Unfortunately, she's not been able to complete her course load at school at that, her, the predicted sort of usual time frame. She's had to take a lot of time off. And we thought, okay, well, let's apply for the compassion access for Trikafta for her because she's had such a, a difficult course. Unfortunately, the application was denied because her lung function was quote unquote too high, her baseline lung function. I saw her in clinic on Tuesday. She was readmitted to the hospital and she's currently receiving IV antibiotics here at St. Michael's Hospital. And I asked her, what would it mean to you to be able to access Trikafta? And she said, I would be able to graduate from university, start my career and live a normal life. Without it, I spend my days attached to an IV pole, isolated from friends and family. And this is such a strange situation because patients actually are hoping that their lung function goes down. They're actually hoping that they're gonna get sicker in the next little while so that they will qualify for access to Trikafta because they know in Canada, they're not gonna get this drug anytime soon. So it's really quite a, a, a difficult situation. So in conclusion, I just wanna say that as a physician who's cared for CF patients for the last 20 years, it's incredibly frustrating to know that there is a drug out there that could actually help 90% of the patients that we look after and not be able to prescribe it. This drug is a total game changer for patients living with CF, and this, this drug really needs to be available to our patients right now.